Why can't you two just get along? So this week we've had uh, two system problems. One is an HDMI problem. It was an AOC or fiber optic cable that failed uh, in an installation. And the other one was two devices that simply don't want to talk to each other. They don't get on, they don't communicate, and they are just a problem couple. And it took a while to uh, a little bit of counseling, a little bit of work, a little bit of adjusting, and the use of um, an arbiter basically to try and sort things out. Which got me thinking about testing, test equipment, reliability, and all that sort of thing. So down here, let's have a look here, just below me on the ground, I don't know if you can see, I have laid out all of our test equipment. I'll just spin the camera around. Let's have a look. Okay, so this is the test equipment that we use on each job. I'll go through them very quickly and then I'll explain to you uh, what each one is. So this pair here, HDMI cable tester. To the right of them, audio impedance tester and tone generator. Simple continuity tester for testing all sorts of cables. Good old multimeter for testing resistance uh, and also continuity and a few other things. A Dayton Audio DATS V3 for testing speaker systems and confirming their performance. This is, I'll just spin it around, this is a MetaGeek Y Spy so that we can uh, make sure that everything's uh, not crashing over each other on the network, especially if we're using Zigbee and things like that. Uh, a network testing kit. This is a, this is a, a basic system, but it uh, makes sure that we've got uh, connectivity, that all the connections are correct. We can also do cable tracing and a few other things with that. It's not a Fluke certifier, obviously, um, but we have used those if we need to certify an installation. This is a GPO tester, which we use uh, for making sure the GPOs are correctly wired. A laser thermometer which we use for checking the temperature of installations, either ones that we are going out to uh, retro uh, inspect and uh, to upgrade, or um, for our own installations to make sure our cooling is working. And finally, something we rarely use, a portable source code, but this also doubles up as a fully capable uh, multimeter as well, which is kind of neat. I'm going to go back to the studio, we're going to take this in one at a time, and we're going to go through the details of each of these and what we use them for. Okay, here we are. Right. So, first cab off the rank, HDMI testers. These are the uh, Meridio Fox and Hound uh, testing kit. You have a, an HDMI generator and you have an HDMI analyzer. And of course, you need a cable. So, as I said, this is an 18 gig set. We have a 40 gig set as well, so we can test cables to both levels. It just means that uh, as technicians, we can have these in our cases if we've got more than one set. Um, they can also be used as fairly handy uh, pattern generators as well. So if you do need to inject a signal or see a pattern on a TV or even do things like uh, uh, setting up your uh, geometry, that, that's handy for that too. <clears throat> okay, you can also capture edit information from components uh, one at a time down the stream or you can catch uh, the com edit data at the end of the stream. So within reason, you can kind of troubleshoot what's going on. Uh, let's test a cable. I'll show you how it works. It's pretty simple. Plug a cable in. Make sure if they are directional that you've got them set the right way around. So source and display, uh, that can be a little bit of a pain. Hold the power buttons for a few seconds. Right, so I go to the analyzer and on there, have I get the angle correct? It says cable test and then on here, there are a range of options. I'm going to go straight for the big one. I'm going to go for 18 gig, which is the one at the top. Hit the enter button. There we go. So this now is generating a signal and sending it through at that bandwidth. And we're just waiting for the result. There we go. Uh, so I've got 5 volt signals okay, then on data channels um, it also says zero errors, DDC pass and HD, HPD pass. So that cable is potentially good, but it only means that it's potentially good between these two devices. 
because let's say there's a problem with the socket on one of the other devices you plug into you cannot make the assumption that just because you've tested the cable that it's actually going to work in a different device because if there's a fault with the socket you got to think about that too these this is just a copper cable um aoc cables the fiber optic ones uh they have electronics in them and also sometimes they need to inject extra voltage so you have like a little usb injector um, often on the display end and uh, so what happened this week was uh, we installed a cable and uh, it worked fine and then all of a sudden the client was just getting image no image image no image image no image and he was pretty convinced at the time that the issue was the Trinov um, but uh, I had a look at the EDID data that was flowing through the system and I thought, no, I don't think so. Um, I don't think the information is getting reported properly back from the projector. It's unlikely the projector has failed. It's possible. Um, so we replaced the AOC cable with a copper cable. Uh, it was a 10 meter one. And lo and behold, life's good. Everything's working. So uh, the assumption sorry, I've got an itchy nose. The assumption is that the uh, electronics in the AOC cable had let us down, or for some reason, there was a drop in the supply voltage, even though there was a uh, five volt booster. So that is HDMI testers. So what we do is we run two HDMI cables on every job. I would like to be pulling fiber optic, like actual fiber optic cable, um so either single mode or multi-mode fiber optic cable for future use um and i've spoken to suppliers but they've been really tardy in getting back to me um but we have reached a stage where you could at least um you know there are a couple of products where you could run fiber optic cable you can terminate either end and uh you know uh, the good thing is you can then cut those ends off and re-terminate which is fantastic uh, and also fiber optic just carries such high bandwidth that you know it's not going to be a problem for us moving forward we should be doing that now. I'm not sure why we're so slow in adopting that. Uh, so we install two cables, uh, one AOC, and if we can over that length, uh, a, a copper cable. And we also test those cables before we go to site, especially, especially if they're going to be run into a roof in such a way as they cannot be removed or replaced. And in fact, we had a job where electricians were installing the cabling. We had, the control was taken away from us. And we warned them, please, 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 A, these are fiber optic, well, at least one of them's a fiber optic cable. Please don't pull on it, twist it, crimp it, damage it, strip it, whatever. And please ensure that, you know, they are directional. Uh, I, I think you really need to be mindful of, especially those long fiber, uh, uh, HDMI runs. And um, on, the, on the other side of the coin, um, shorter HDMI cables as well are a hot topic too. Uh, Jim Peterson at um, Lumigen raised an issue over there being signal issues with really short cables. Cable manufacturers are saying now that's not an issue. I'm not sure that I believe that. So as a policy, all our cables are two meters or longer, regardless of how short the run is. Um, so that's kind of our HDMI philosophy. Two cables to the display, uh, preferably different types, or at the very least different manufacturers, so we don't have repeat issues and uh, all other cables over two meters and every single cable is labeled all right i'll go get the next test device this this is a dats v3 uh, it's made by dayton audio you can look it up I, i'm not going to go into great detail on it you can have a look online at what it does it plugs into your laptop with a USB cable, and then you connect these to your speaker. And you can use this for a lot of different things. It's used by a lot of speaker designers and builders to test the performance of the driver. Um, so you can test the speaker in free air. You can then test it in an enclosure. You can then test your crossovers. And what it does is it just uh, does a sweep of the speaker and looks at uh, its impedance and resonant frequencies and things like that. Um, what it means is that we can run this on every speaker that goes into a job and have a look at the profile of that speaker and that any speaker that's got an issue or flaw, we are immediately going to identify that. Um, likewise, after they're installed, when we're calibrating, we take a snapshot of the uh, frequency response of each of the speakers too. So you would be surprised 
uh, the number of speakers that we get out of the factory that are faulty or when we arrive on jobs that other people have done where speakers are either not connected or there's a driver not connected or uh, you know there's a problem with the crossover or there's a wire disconnected and nobody's ever noticed so uh, that's what the DATS V3 does it's what we do before we send a speaker out of here um, so we know that it's performing the way it should uh, so go to Dayton Audio, have a look at their website, um, and you can see how the software works. Uh, but uh, yeah, I won't bore you with endless hours of uh, screen images. The next one, this is a fairly simple device, but handy. This is an audio impedance tester. Uh, now, the DATS V3 already kind of tests this, but um, what this does, this only tests at one frequency, it's a thousand hertz, and we can dial in um, the expected impedance for us it's 20 ohms or less and then we just connect this to the speaker and I hit this button here and when this is connected to a speaker it makes a tone all right so we use this to bell out or check the locations of our speakers to make sure that where we've wired them to is where they really are but at the same time we take a note of that impedance at a thousand hertz of each and every speaker just to make sure that uh, something's not astray okay so this gives us uh, it's basic information it's certainly not um, comprehensive the comprehensive data comes from the DATS v3 but this just is after it's been installed is just a double check um, and so you know for example we know that on the Priscilla p5v's I think we show about 15 ohms so we expect to see fairly consistently 15 ohms uh, impedance on every P5V that we put in. And if suddenly one is five ohms or 30 ohms or something like that, we're gonna start going, hmm, something's not right. Okay, so that's that. Next one. This is a really simple device. Um, in fact, I'll just grab a cable. This is quite simply a continuity tester and it has fittings for almost all cables. There is an HDMI one as well. Um, we don't have that one. Uh, and given we've got the HDMI tester, we probably don't need it. Um, but boy, you've got everything. You've got DIN fittings, RCAs, phonos. Uh, you've got RJ45, you've got USBs, you've got uh, speak-ons, pretty much everything you want. So let's just test this cable. So XLR on one side, XLR on the other. And all you have to do, you can see there's two lights, and all I have to do is rotate the knob for each of those channels or signal wires. See, and I've got two, wire, two lights there, two lights there. That means that I don't have any cross connections or shorts, and that I've got continuity on all three pins. All right, so again, it's not a comprehensive test, it's just, yeah, this cable should work. Um, but if there's anything glaringly obvious, if there's a misconnection or a, uh, um, a dry joint or, or anything like that, then this immediately shows that up. So all our RCAs, all our XLRs, anything we're testing goes through that. And then what we can do is, of course, the good old multimeter, and then we can check the resistance and continuity um, with a multimeter as well uh, should we have any issues all of these are in our toolbox on each and every job okay next fun isn't it toys okay this is a fairly simple one but I reckon it should be in every toolbox this is what are they actually they call it PowerPoint and earth leakage tester so this tests um, GPOs uh, power outlets it makes sure they're properly wired up and if there's an ELCB or an RCD or depending on what you call it in your part of the world um, this can also test the effectiveness of the RCD um, and make sure that it's working but I'm predominantly more interested to make sure um, that the actual connections to the GPO are as they should be um, that way, you know, if uh, someone's been tinkering or, you know, if they left uh, an earth or a neutral off or who knows, something like that, or, uh, or if the uh, active and neutral are reversed, that's kind of handy to know. Okay. Um, 
Right, this is a fun one. This is the MetaGeek Y Spy. An antenna screws on the end here, and a USB cable goes in the end here. Now again, I'm not going to bore you with the details, but I can connect this to my phone, iPad, and um, it gives me uh, spectrum analysis for radio frequencies. Where this is really useful for us is when we suspect there's uh, 2.4G or 5G interference, um, Wi-Fi, 5G, uh, or if we have conflict between, say, a 2.4 uh, Wi-Fi signal and uh, Zigbee. Um, so it allows us to move channels around to get the clearest and most reliable signal in something like Control 4 or Zigbee or Mesh um, devices. Uh, so. The only problem is this is a fluid landscape. We can test this today, but if someone comes along with a different router tomorrow or someone then goes out and buys a cordless phone system or something, that changes the landscape. But whilst we're there, we can at least sign off and say, look, you know, here's the separation between your channels and everything's working. What else have we got? Network tester. Uh, where are we? Analyzer. Analyzer and a signal generator or signal injector, obviously charger here, and these uh, are remotes that can go on the other end, so we can identify cables, and we can also test that they are wire mapped properly. So this is actually a handy little device. It's uh, not massively expensive, but extremely useful. It does give us cable lengths, and it does give us some basic stats on the data cables that have been installed. I wouldn't, you know, certify a system with this. You can't. Uh, for that, we would probably hire a Fluke um, network uh, uh, tester and use that to certify a network, which we can do. Right, on to the next one. This is a laser thermometer. And we carry it in all our toolkits because we come across a lot of rooms where um, AV equipment has been shoved into a cabinet with no clearance whatsoever, no air movement, and they're overheating. So with a quick zap, we can have a look at the temperature of the devices. We can have a look at um, the standards and specs for the device, and we can quickly say, yes, your uh, AVR is cooking or your amplifiers are cooking or... Um, or we can make sure that the circulation that you've got or the space that you've got in your cabinets, if it's something that we haven't installed, is, is okay. Heat management's important. It's insidious because it's something that your equipment survives for a period of time, but eventually kills itself. And uh, it's something that still these days not a lot of consideration is given to. Um, we get a lot of cabinets who get very cabinet makers who get very enthusiastic about building cabinets for equipment, not understanding that we need the clearance, we need the air circulation. And look, on that note, if you are a cabinet maker or if you're building something for your AV equipment, it's pretty simple. Behind the doors at the front, what we do is we do a rebate, so there's a cutout. So when you shut the door, there's actually a now a gap behind the door. And then we make sure that there's airflow at the back, so we create a convection path. So the hot air goes up, draws the cool air off the floor and through the unit. And uh, that's at the very least the, the ventilation you should have. And we do that on all the shelves. So air can flow up the front, can be drawn out the back, and as a chimney effect, um, and at least that gets air moving, uh, and that's kind of the very first consideration. If you don't do that, it, it just having a mesh uh, or a kind of speaker grill type material over the front is not enough. It doesn't do it, doesn't promote airflow, and it doesn't let enough air move freely through it to keep your equipment cool. My favorite toy, one I use the least, but I really love it, is a handheld oscilloscope. Good for testing signals, good for uh, looking at noise or interference. Um, eh, this one obviously has a limited range. I think this is 40 meg uh, from memory. Um, well, actually, I think it's 100 meg. I think, you know, I think I lashed out. I think this is a 100 meg unit. Um, but it's also a multimeter. It doubles as a multimeter as well. So it does the same things that this does. Um, I just think it's really cool. Um, I have used it to troubleshoot things like uh, ground loop issues, uh, 50 hertz in Australia, 50 hertz, uh, AC hum, uh, and stuff like that. Okay, so there you go. 
Uh, that's what we do um, when we test our equipment. Now we burn in our equipment for our clients. So we unbox with their permission, we unbox their equipment. We put it together in the factory here. We make sure everything works. If we can, we program up the control four uh, or whatever control system it is. Um, we make sure that the cables that are going through the device actually give a signal that the system turns on and off and it's reliable. And you know what? We still have issues uh, despite all of that, but we do catch an awful lot in that process. Um, so, you know, we do jobs far afield, so we need to know they're stable and we need to know that we can rely on them. And, uh, you know, I think there's a long way to go before HDMI manufacturers, uh, cable manufacturers, device manufacturers, HDMI board manufacturers, uh, are all speaking the same language. And I have it on fairly good authority that, um, the people who sit on these authorities, on these panels, um, uh, can be somewhat opinionated, I guess, and that um, certain companies say, no, there's nothing wrong with our product when everyone else is going, well, we think there is, but they carry too much weight. So, you know, my appeal to the companies is this, stop thinking about yourselves, start thinking about your customers. HDMI is an absolute headache. Well, here's an interesting one, actually, for those of you who have lasted this video so far. So... I mentioned before we had the old chestnut uh, of um, putting a BenQ X12000H with a Trinov. Now, sometimes you can be lucky and strike a cable that doesn't give you an issue, but if you put some cables with a Trinov and an X12000H, the two do not play well together at all. They just don't. Uh, the workaround for us, and, and the fact that I have to say workaround is disturbing, but the workaround is for us to put um, a device between the Trinov and the BenQ X12000H. In our case, a uh, splitter, HDMI splitter. You put that in line and that has its own 5 volt power supply, which, as which I suspect also helps resolve some power issues in the cable. I'm, you know, We don't know what the fault is. And uh, Trinov says it's not them. BenQ says it's not them. The cable manufacturers, of course, say it's not them. So obviously no one's to blame except there's still a problem so by putting in a uh, a splitter or, or any kind of almost any kind of hdmi device between the trinov and the benq x 12000h they now talk to each other that is lunacy right we have standards um they really should work together you know they really should communicate um but uh, obviously something's going on somewhere within these three components the cable the the processor and the projector that um just makes them not work so um I, i'm not a big fan i've got to say if if there's a uh, problem with the product i'm not a big fan of the company saying well just go and buy one of these and add it on or just go do this and add it on or because that's not that's a band-aid solution right that's not fixing the problem it's it's eliminating the problem with with an add-on device um you know uh, and I, I don't know that that's that's a solution it's a temporary fix um and you know we actually carried on about this for a long time uh well over a year and there was never a solution there was never a solution from that we heard of anyway from benq or from trinov or from the cable manufacturers at all uh, and please, I'm not pointing a finger at any one of them, but I am pointing a question mark at them going, what's going on, guys? Uh, interestingly enough, um, Trinov have updated their HDMI boards since that issue occurred. So I'm kind of inclined at this point in time to say, hey, Trinov, you've got a free pass. I think you're, you're okay because you have a completely different board and the problem remains. So I'm kind of thinking, thank you, maybe. Who knows? All right, guys. So... I hope that's interesting enough for you. I hope it gives you an idea of some of the tools that you know are handy to have when you're installing cinema. Uh, I hope that uh, it's given you some idea of also the lengths that we go to to eliminate problems before they begin and to make life easier for us and for our clients. Doesn't mean nothing goes wrong and equipment, do, equipment does fail after the fact. Uh, and then it comes down to customer service and making damn sure that we're looking after our clients. All right. Thanks again, guys. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.